Fantastic. So welcome, everyone. Uh, so this is the first um, IPM speaker series for this semester. We like to start out the start of the series with a pit speaker each time. And we're really happy to have one of our own today, Jonathan Silverstein. Jonathan is professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics in the School of Medicine at Pitt. He's also Chief Research Informatics Officer in the Health Sciences and actually for the Institute for Precision Medicine. He's also an affiliate scholar at the Pitt Cyber. Jonathan earned his medical degree uh, from Washington University in St. Louis and his Master's of Science from the Harvard School of Public Health. He was actually an attending general surgeon for seven years and uh, saw the light and uh, started to do informatics. And while he was the attending general surgeon, he was also the lead physician informatician for the enterprise EMR deployments at uh, University of Chicago and University of uh, Illinois at Chicago. He is, because of that, he's a fellow of both the American College of Surgeons and of the American College of Medical Informatics. Uh, previously to his coming to Pitt, J uh, Jonathan was Vice President and Davis Family Chair of Informatics at North Shore University Health System and the Associate Director of the Computation Institute at the University of Chicago and the Argonne National Laboratory. Jonathan is recognized as one of the three founding scientific directors of the Chicago Biomedical Consortium, which some of you may have heard about. He most, prior to coming to Pitt, he most recently served as Chief Medical Informatics Officer at Tempus, which uh, is a one of the leading genetic testing companies in cancer, which many of you know. Jonathan is internationally known for his expertise and research in the application advanced computing architectures to biomedicine. Uh, he's an expert in learning health systems um, and upon coming to Pitt has really expanded his work, uh, enabling biomedical science, in particular, um, large data sharing, which is where I've done quite a lot of work with Jonathan and thoroughly enjoyed it. So Jonathan, I'll hand it over and Jonathan will tell us about biological and medical data sharing, coordination, architectures and infrastructures. Jonathan, looking forward to this. Well, thank you for that very generous introduction and the chance to talk with the with the group. It looks like there's uh, 30 of you I can't see, which is always a funny thing to, to talk into one's own screen, but we will do that. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and kick off your uh, seminars for the for the year. And so, um, yeah, let's get right into it. So let's see if I can find a way to move forward. There we go. So I wanted to offer an outline of this talk because the way that I tend to give a talk, it gets rather chaotic and um, there is a thread that carries through, I assure you. Um, I do. I will say a bit about learning health systems that uh, Adrian mentioned. I will talk a little bit about uh, why breast cancer is a thematic domain for this talk. There's a few themes running through this. One is learning health systems. One is around breast cancer. Um, one are the some of the core principles around data management and sharing. And so we'll talk about that. And then I have sort of a, a thematic um, I, icon for you to remember. You know, there's only one thing that you need to remember this entire talk, and it's about the DIKW pyramid and stick figure. So when we get there, Pay attention, um, remember it. it. If you forget everything else, it will serve you well for a long future. I will spend the, the body of the talk after going waist deep into the body before getting to the neck, um, talking about data architectures and infrastructures. And I'm going to do this in a way that is all by example of projects that I have a very direct hand in. I find that this is uh, really useful to offer up these uh, principles, but also to tell folks about what's happening and, and what is the art of the possible by things we've done. I will go in a little deeper than I normally would with the extended time that we have um, and talk about um, knowledge graphs. This is uh, where we get uh, neck deep into this kind of uh, architecture and infrastructure um, and, and use crazy words like ontology and things like this that um, make some scientists a bit crazy, but they are, are necessary. And then I'm going to wrap up and bring these things together at the end and talk about really how some of these things are coming together in Pittsburgh and why this is a, an amazing place for this kind of thing now and, and for a very long future. So with that, um, I did want to start out um, with sort of a definitional slide and a, and a reminder of what we're talking about and what we're trying to accomplish. If you go you know, way back into ancient history, in the um, you know earlier 2000s, um, there was a specific effort around what was then the Institute of Medicine and now is the National Academy of Medicine to really think about you know what it is that we're really trying to do. 
with the health system in in the United States in particular, but around the world. And and this movement really has moved tremendously around the world through the work of uh, someone named uh, Charles Friedman, Chuck Friedman, who actually um, ran the Center for Biomedical Informatics here before it became a department under uh, Mike Besage. And uh, he and I and a number of people work on this for, for some years thinking about really what it is that we're trying to do with all of this data and learning and moving things forward. And it's just become more and more important um, over time that the health systems themselves are spinning off data and the biology science is spinning off data. And how do we get these into a, a positive reinforcing uh, cycle? So I'm, I'm hoping you can see where I'm pointing at things. Much of what we're going to talk about is this thing that we, that, you know, Chuck and I sort of discovered along the way of thinking about this, there was this notion that you would take knowledge and through good implementation in a health system or in a biology lab or wherever you would take knowledge and you would, you would, you know, turn it into good effect, um, affect people's lives, um, do good experimentation, whatever it is. And then this would result on the other side from knowledge to practice to, um, from, you know, from, uh, from data to knowledge. And we realized that there's this gap in between, and this gap is massive. It's a third of the whole cycle, which is turning the turning the actual events that are going on into some kind of usable data that you could actually move over to knowledge. And so part of the thesis of this is that, you know, and, and those of you that are doing uh, scientific projects that involve data from multiple sources, that involve complex multidimensional data, you know, more than half of the time spent, I'm going to assert, uh, with, a, with no evidence for this except experience, is spent organizing, managing the data, getting it in the right shape, rather than doing the actual um, analysis. And it's, you know, I think in the, in the work that we've done with Adrian, I'm going to say it's, it's, you know, an enormous fraction <laughs> of, the, of the work. Um, the analysis, of course, being done well is really what is the thing that makes um, advances in the field and research papers and so forth. But getting data in a way that we can really make sense of it and organize it is such a critical piece to everything we're doing. So there's a lot of thought here in talking about what are the infrastructures that make it really possible to get good data out of really complex uh, environments. And then there's this other piece that one has to start this circle somewhere. And the other thing that we sort of determined is, or um, asserted maybe is a better word, um, that the maybe the right place is to start sort of here as you go into the cycle, which is there's some data that's existent that you can sort of start with, turn it into something, look around and then start asking really good questions rather than starting at any other particular place. And so I'll, I'll come back to this but I wanted to put it out there as a framework to think about the things that we're describing, whether it's in uh, clinical data, whether it's in biological data, it, it sort of fits into this framework. And what we're really trying to accomplish is to, you know, the University of Chicago's uh, theme used to be, or still is, but I'm not there, is, um, you know, let knowledge grow and grow so that life may be enriched. Right, and so it's really fundamentally about knowledge, and we'll, we'll spend a lot of time talking about uh, what knowledge is um, here a little bit later, as I mentioned. Okay, that was a lot. So let's jump right in to some of these examples. So one of the things that I, I will talk about briefly here, and then I'll come back to, is the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, um, based on some uh, work that we've done together with Adrian, based on the other work that I would describe to you, came around a couple of years ago and said, gee, we really want to put together a data sharing hub that really would be a central place where the clinical data, research data would come in. And, um, you know, it was an interesting conversation about, you know, could a vendor do that? And really it started out as, you know, who, who what big company should we get in to come and deliver this thing for us? And that resulted in a conversation of, well, what are we trying to, to achieve? And I'll offer a couple of slides on that. And like I said, I'll come back to these later and tell you more about that particular hub. But the idea was, and, and the reason I use this particular one is because I, I very much like, as I said, to, to speak through example, but this one hits right on point for the kinds of things that architecture and infrastructure have a tremendous impact on. And if, if, if you don't get them right, you, you sort of suffer for long periods of time. So if you really want to leap forward on usability and use 
and democratization, democratization of data rather than sort of incremental progress with a lab handing data to another lab and working with another lab and, and you know, slowly growing, you, you really have to intentionally collect data across multiple locations and incorporate other public data. You have to reduce the friction of people to use that data. That's a lot of work. Um, and you have to make it reusable in arbitrary combinations because you're not really sure what everyone is going to do, right? There's data that's collected for a specific purpose and much of the purposes of data that have very, very long legs are not anticipated at the very beginning. Um, things like the Human Genome Project is the, is the sort of preeminent example. And, and um, in this um, community, TCGA is an example. And um, we think HubMap is probably another future example we'll, we'll see. Um, the, and then one has to deal with the policy and the flexible and security privacy requirements of these kinds of data that are coming from humans. And then finally, really want to co-localize uh, data and computation analysis tools. So tools and, and the actual hardware of computation and the data need to come together in some way so that the user doesn't have to, you know, constantly assemble them on, on their own. And so these are ideals and these are things that we are bringing together in a number of projects. So these are really goals. And then the, re the reflection of that is, well, how do you, how do you achieve these goals? So we have to have data collection that's high quality. Um, there has to be consistent metadata, robust provenance. Provenance is this thing of where is this data been? How was it collected? Um, you have to think in advance about how to make the data findable, interoperable, reusable. Data sets and collections have to be per permanently persistent. They have things like digital object identifiers or DOIs like, like research papers do. So you can go back to that exact data. Um, and of course, they have to meet the privacy and security requirements, which get quite granular and require the kind of expertise to understand the data that one has, what can, one can do with it, and what to choose to do with it and to plan ahead in such ways in consents and other um, IRB protocols and activities that one can actually do the things that, uh, that one wants to do. And then, um, and then, of course, part of bringing computation with the data, as I mentioned, isn't really entirely about convenience, as I implied in the last slide. It's also about the fairness and the undocumented method. So if you bring computation and tools and APIs and architectures and data together in the same place at the same time, then someone can repeat what was done. And the repeatability goes back to the findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. I, I always think of the R as, as repeatable. Reusable is, is a different thing and it meant a different thing, but to me, um, to have someone to be able to do the same analysis that was done off of the same data in the same way, right down to the bits and bytes in a GitHub repository, I think is a science that we don't have yet in general and that we're very much trying to, to accomplish. Okay, so this is the only slide that you need in this entire talk. So, And it's very simple. It's even got its CC by SA for references to show you where I got them from. And then I have the the permissions to show you this, these images and this data, which I, you know, as I mentioned, these are important features of reusability. So we've seen this, this pyramid of data uh, begets information, begets knowledge, uh, begets wisdom. We've seen stick figures. Why are they on the same slide? Well, here's the thesis. And this is the, like I said, the takeaway of this, of this talk. Um, if you're going to start working in data as wide as that base of that pyramid is, one doesn't necessarily have to get in too deep. You can wade in with your little tippy toes. You can wade into your ankles. You can maybe try some AI system and just run it for you over the data that you've learned how to play with in, a, in an R package or even in a TensorFlow or something else. Um, we're not going to talk about AI here because we're talking about how to build up data information knowledge. but. Um, in the data world and working in data, while it, where its quality is important, how it's collected, everything, as an intellectual activity, one only has to get in sort of ankle deep. In that transition of turning the data into information, which I talked about, which begins to make it usable and reusable, my goodness, you really have to get in waist deep. And I think this is the message that is almost always lost on folks that don't spend their time in the infrastructure and in doing data sharing and delivery is that 
one really can't turn things into usable information in a useful way without going awfully deep, engaging very directly with the generators of the data. You know, I will talk about a number of uh, groups and a huge consortia we'll be talking about here in a moment um, that collect data from dozens of places with really complicated standards. And, you know, we can put those standards out and we can say, fill all these buckets of columns and rows and JSON metadata files and directory structures and, and, and you know, um, formats of images and formats of sequencing data. And people can meet all of those requirements and have data that's completely useless. Because you have to go way steep and make sure that the data that you're collecting, you understand somewhat how it's going to be processed, where it came from. Is this metadata filling in the box or is it really mean something? And what is the definition of every row and column and cell in the metadata? And is that in fact what it means? You know, whether it's uh, clinical data, clinical data has this very similar looking field <laughs> in electronic medical records. There may be a dozen of them that if just at a brief look, they mean exactly the same thing. But one of them is heavily utilized in every case and is collected in a specific way and um, is the one that you want to contribute from that institution. Well, that exact choice of which field to represent that common standard might be a different field at a different institution. And if you just pass around a code and say, yeah, we have this Epic implementation and you run this thing and it puts your data into that data format, it will meet, it will engineer right across the board. It will not be a, a, a problem until you look at the data and you see that it's completely useless. And so, it's not a technical issue, it's a socio-technical issue. So we have the technology and we have the people and you have to go in waist deep, um, engaging with the people that are generating data, understanding what it is before you can do anything useful at scale. That's the, that's the thesis. And we will spend some time talking about how we get in waist deep. And much of this talk will be in the body part, the information and knowledge. I will not talk a lot about wisdom because we would drown if this was water because it would get up above our our necks and we don't want to do that. And I don't think we're, at least I'm not smart enough yet to talk about wisdom, but we will get up to knowledge. And um, like I said, we'll talk a bit in the about the data and then we'll the body of the talk will be about the inf information and knowledge, excuse me. So I think um, it's very lonely to talk without seeing all of you. And so if there are questions, I'm going to ask to to, to throw them in. I didn't say this at the beginning, but I'm going to try and run if there aren't any questions till about um, a quarter to the hour with plenty of time to ask questions. So you're welcome to, to hold them if you prefer to do that. Okay. So what are these big projects that, that I, I keep referring to? So I'm going to offer a few and they all have this similar characteristic of being data coming in from multiple sources very often multiple independent sources that are individual um, organizations, entities. Um, and so there's a socio-technical aspect, as I mentioned, of bringing that uh, data together, making the data reusable and moving it forward. I see there's a chat question. Maybe I'll take a look. Oh, that's Adrian. Okay, great. That was me, Johnson. Sorry. Fantastic. So, um, the, so the chat is working and go for it. So, the three that I'm going to focus on in this section to really get in a little bit deeper and really show where the data is coming from and how it can be used and what we do to support all the users of this data are the, the Research Informatics Office, which is our group in the in Department of Biomedical Informatics that's supported by many different um, grants, some of which I'll mention here, uh, some of which I, I won't, as well as a chargeback service, which I will describe in some detail here. I think it's quite relevant to get down to that level of detail. So the Research Informatics Office is fundamentally about supporting investigators at Pitt and UPMC that are doing work coming from electronic health record data. And it could be a clinical trial, it could be retrospective uh, data analysis, it could be any number of things that require use of the, the clinical data in some, in some bulk more than you would do reviewing the charts uh, by hand. The next one is the Human Biomolecular Atlas Program, and I'll talk a little bit about what the Common Fund is at NIH and how these programs evolve and what they are. But the, the HubMap program is focused on building a set of, of atlas of the human body that is at the cellular and molecular scale. And you say, well, that's impossible. And it's, it's a sampling, right? It's not every cell in one person in the way that the human genome was done in one 
you know, person because every cell is different. And so the genome is different and the transcription is, is well, the genome is theoretically the same, not quite. The transcription is different. The proteins are different, um, et cetera. And so this is a rather large consortium doing uh, fine-grained, um, detailed uh, single cell uh, data collection um, through many organs in, in the human body to establish a normal standard, if you will, of uh, molecular human uh, data, spatial molecular human data. This has been said to be the, you know, do the genome project in every one of two trillion cells. <laughs> I think that's a bit um, hyperbolic, but it does feel that way at times with data coming from more than 60 sites that we'll describe with many different technologies and so forth. The, the next one is the cellular uh, senescence network, which is another common fund program that we've had the good uh, fortune, I guess, maybe good work to do on the HubMap program that has allowed us to move forward with a similar team uh, on the SendNet program, which has a much more specific science focus of doing this kinds of mapping, but looking for the molecular details of the senescent cells within, uh, within tissues. And this obviously has implications related to um, lifespan, cancer, um, neurological uh, disease, immunological disease. And so this serves as a fundamental foundation. You can think about HubMap as kind of a foundation of pure biological. SendNet is pure biological, but sort of heading in, into another area. Then I'll talk about some other clinical projects that are supported through the Research Informatics Office. Okay. So what happens when we start up these consortia is they get going and um, they start producing uh, research papers based on the data. And so I show these, they're actually a bit dated. I think these were grabbed in January and, and I didn't re-grab them now, but they're doing the thing <laughs> that you'd expect. Um, Senate is particularly taking off rapidly in its first a uh, couple of years. And what happens is we see data coming in, we see the work that people are doing, and we assemble these Google Scholar pages that show the papers that are associated with the, the, with the awards. And then Google for us finds all of those citations and you get charts like this. But they take off incredibly fast in a very short period of time. And the only way to do that is to is to be very well organized, understand the data that's coming in, understand the responsibilities of managing the consortium, getting people to interact with each other, um, and just really, you know, shortening the cycle time of every piece of it that you possibly can, because these things spin up and go down in a matter of years. So I'm going to jump now into the health record research request. This is a slide that some of you have seen if you've used our services because I've, I've offered this many times, it's online. I'm gonna go through it very fast. Um, it's probably a 15 minute presentation by itself and I'm trying to accomplish it in a few minutes. But this is a collaboration with um, people in our own department with Mike Bisich, many of you know, uh, the, the Associate Director in CTSI and Sean Sasuaran, who's the Informatics Director. We're all professors in uh, biomedical informatics and have built up this infrastructure of clinical data um, and a service wrapped around it that allows that clinical data to be used for research. And so let me just describe that very quickly. So use PMC and PIT in collaboration. They want to make this data available. That's the goal through, through my office, something that we've created. We work on behalf of UPMC. So there's actually a legal arrangement under HIPAA for PIT to do this work on behalf of UPMC, which is really interesting because we have the responsibility to manage the data in a way that's relevant to the, to the community as well as check that the IRBs have all the right um, constructs and so forth. So we operate as a, a health sciences core facility, although the funding support is all from um, uh, grants and chargebacks and um, there's a whole UPMC policy around this, okay? So there's a technical frame we'll talk about, but a policy frame, I've said this a couple of times, is equally important. So this slide is very busy, but it's worth spending a few minutes on. This is really the crux of what um, the CRIO's office at PID at this time is, is fundamentally supporting. And then we have the other uh, funded research that we'll talk about as well. So what happened is we, you know, I came and we started up this project in uh, 2017. So it's still pretty young. And um, with some support from the CTSI in informatics and, and backing uh, by uh, Institute of Precision Medicine, we started this uh, service based on data collecting from the EMRs. And what's shown in this is where we are now. 
So it's evolved rapidly. If you look at the very left side, we have data flowing in um, vast amount of data of, across many, many different domains of data from Epic, from Cerner, from the Mars system, which is going away, um, from the Children's Hospital Warehouse, which is another Cerner implementation. There's additional Epic implementations uh, because of uh, acquired hospital systems. There are the full text of notes. I'll show you something on that. We have DICOM images. I'm not going to talk much about this today, and it's actually my own area of more expertise, but there's petabytes of data in the, in the vendor neutral archive that UPMC has collected, and we've worked with the enterprises to accomplish an at-scale process where we can get thousands of, or tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of imaging studies um, extracted in a way that we can then run them through de-identification, other kinds of processes that we need to run. We have a separate business associates uh, agreement with the health plan because the health plan data and the clinical data are not supposed to work together operationally, but they can in research. Uh, we get some clinical trials data that comes in, um, collaboration with the cancer registry, collaboration with certain tissue banks, and then um, with the PID plus me and the, the genome sequencing center and, and, and mommy data. So all of these things are coming into what we call domains. They're all generally coming for the most part as flat files or from uh, databases. And so we bring them in on the UPMC side of the house in a data sourcing layer. So mostly in Oracle, but some flat files. Um, and um, we use the UPMC resources to identify patients, specifically identified, including the master patient index. But we discover that the master patient index has, has, uh, has you know, modes of failure, right? Because it's all about billing and it's all about getting transactions through. But if somebody was here five years ago and they weren't here and they come back, they may get a new medical record number. It could be that the Enterprise Master Index fixed it, but it might not be. And we might discover that those are coming from different systems that never talk to each other within the overall clinical enterprise. There was no need for them to. They had an x-ray someplace. They had something else somewhere else. And we find that we actually match and consolidate into individual uh, patient IDs that we then mint as a research patient ID and manage even more completely than uh, the master patient index. We then aggregate that data on the PIT side. So this is a big strategy that we use. And this goes to those many principles I mentioned at the beginning, where we actually keep the data on one side of the house on a totally different network and keep the identity on the other side of the house in a, in a totally different network with these Oracle databases linked together in certain specific ways under very tightly controlled uh, circumstances. Then we also build out um, transformation layers. Um, the ontology piece, this is a piece we'll talk a little bit about that, that I, I'll get excited about when we get there. And then we do all the de-identification, processing, regulatory management, and we deliver through a single sign-on system of Globus, I'll mention again, that really provides a few key things for us. Federated identity, which means people from other institutions such as UPMC and Pitt um, can come in with their two-factor authentication without us having to get all hung up about where they're coming from, but we know where they're coming from. We know precisely who they are and we can give them the authorization to the correct things without having to have multiple systems uh, managing that because of the integration that the that the Globus team has done over years. It also performs a very high performance. We move terabytes of data. It moves very quickly. Um, and it it has a, a HIPAA. Um, HIPAA doesn't have certification, but it, it essentially asserts that um, all the logging and other things that uh, HIPAA requires are done within that system. So a quick look at the at the domains of data. We have about 5 million patients in this going back to 2004 for some resources, 2011 for other resources. Older, older stuff we've chosen not to address because of the, you'll see the, in a slide I'll show you the growth of the health system and, and record sets. It made sense um, to choose those points in time, but there's, you know, some of these things go into the billions and hundreds of millions and uh, petabytes in terms of uh, data. We, um, in some cases, process those things in AWS, some cases on site. Um, using the the bridges at, at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center or in the, uh, the CRC, depending on the the um, computing resource center at Pitt, depending on the security nature of it, right? So um, things that are um, need HIPAA security, we tend to keep at Pitt. Things we can de-identify and, and really turn into tokenization, we can move on to even bigger infrastructures. And these produce for about 100 investigators with data 
in different investigator teams, 100 teams each year. So every every week we're sending out a couple sets of data to something for something or other, whether it's these huge projects like the ACT network, or all of us, or the PATH network, whether it's disease specific marks or MARTs um, or individual investigators, this is a very high flow uh, sort of uh, system that um, has now been working for several years. And um, I'm gonna show you one of the resources in it just as a, as a teaser, I guess, um, of the kinds of things that we can do with all of those things um, consolidated uh, together in support of other investigators. So we're really science as a service to other investigators is science. And um, if you look on the bottom right, this is the Elasticsearch service in which we've put um, approximately half a billion clinical text notes, which is mostly all of them, um, across the UPMC system in here. Um, after that de-identification step, it's not perfect, so we can't distribute it to the community. It still has PHI in it. And, and you know, when you get to, you know, a 1% error at, at 500 million records, you have a lot of records that have identity, and that's not an easily solved problem. And so we can support querying the system and using it for others and delivering data for others, but it's not something we can release widely because it will contain protected health information. But in any case, you can see the growth on the bottom of the UPMC in terms of the number of notes that are coming in. You see there's, you know, there's a little dip off there with the pandemic there in 2000 in terms of the regular growth, and then it comes back. And again, um, this is earlier in, in, in this year. So this is all patients you see unique count of patients and what their their age and, and demographics are um, in a very, very simplistic way here, just to show this simplistically. And so if we now take this and we type in the search box, something like um, metastatic breast cancer, everything shifts and it does it pretty instantaneously. This is maybe 10 or 15 seconds while it, cal while it recalculates this over all of the text index over all of that entire thing. This means that it says metastatic breast cancer somewhere. Does it say this patient's father had metastatic breast cancer? It could, but of course the vast majority of them are patients that, that have uh, metastatic breast cancer. So it's used as a guide and you can see the demographics shift heavily towards female as you'd expect. Interestingly, the, the, the you know, general collection of race with all of the difficulties that that occurs, one can see it doesn't change much, which I found kind of interesting that, um, that it you know, still remains uh, proportionate to those populations. And then you can see here very much of a dip, which is a different effect in the pandemic, which says, okay, people weren't getting notes and being seen or whatever that means <laughs> related to their metastatic breast cancer. And we know this has occurred. We, we all know this based on the reduction in visits and, and um, the types of visits that were harder to get um, during this period of um, uh, you know, pandemic. Okay. This is a quick slide around the divisions that, we, that we've that uh, we served over time. They start to stack on top of each other. The point is that there are many divisions. There's some th interesting things like communication science, computer science over here, uh, some in engineering. Um, they're not all uh, the medical arena, but with the big ones, of course, medicine and pediatrics. And um, I think the surgery is distributed in various places here as opposed to being grouped entirely together and then another big uh, user is psychiatry and, psych and psychology. But but it, it's really in broad use. Um, at any given time, there's you know, 100 to 150 that we're working on and we've passed, we're well past 600 uh, teams that have had data delivered to them. And that's real data delivery, not just um, talking to them and thinking about what they're going to do. Although the majority of the requests we get um, do not result in uh, in data delivery, either letters of support for grants, how would I do this, all of these kinds of things. And that activity is supported by CTSI. So let me finish this up now. Um, we This is a little bit of too much detail for this talk, but it is a high request volume when you work with us, pay attention to your tracking number, talk to us, we will help you. And we will forget we've talked with you because it's such a large process. We take detailed notes, you come back and we, we sort that out. There's a request service on the rio.pit.edu. And oh, this is all we ask for. This is the entire form. Tell us about your project, who you are, and with whether you meet several of these criteria that tells us 
all of that information about how we can approach, who are the right people to talk to, what kinds of data are we going to work with? And then this is where the flow charts, flow charts start. And there's going to be a lot of flow charts in the next 10 minutes. So, you know, you have an initial request. We see if it's feasible. We check out the IRB uh, protocol with you. Um, we determine a, that it's approved, that there is a budget somewhere that it can actually account for the work that's going to be done. And then, you know, we move it forward to, to data delivery. And what we've discovered is that no matter how you rearrange this, you need to have a chat with people up front. And this goes again to this very personal thing that's very socio-technical. People answer those questions, they get those checkboxes wrong because they're working on their science. They don't know, you don't know the detailed regulatory information. You don't want to know. <laughs> you just want to come in and get the data that, you, that you're looking for as quickly as you can sometimes feasible, sometimes not feasible. Sometimes the data doesn't exist. Sometimes it hasn't been collected yet. Uh, sometimes um, it's the wrong kind of data for what the question that you really wanna answer. Okay, I'm gonna skip over that. So I mentioned the, these big projects that this thing supports. And so the Neptune, so Pitt and UPMC are enormous as we all know. And so it's one of the largest contributors to the All of Us research program. And that data flows through uh, Neptune and we, we send it on up the, up the chain through that. So that's one of those programs. And this is just a snapshot of the data uh, location. You can see here's you know 700,000 patients. So what happens is you have to think about the question you're asking. Do you need exposure to 5 million patients in our, in our network that are Western Pennsylvania and around the world? Do you need 700,000 patients that have very detailed genomics, which is what the All of Us program is about collecting, um, that are scattered around in a different kind of way that are volunteers, but don't really represent anything epidemiologically? Um, you know, are you looking for support with the PATH network? So this is another network that we support and we, we provide the hub uh, for, this, for this network, which is a hub of hubs in the um, patient-centered outcome research network. Here we have 10 million patients records that are represented across these institutions listed, uh, listed down here that work according to a data standard with a database that's distributed in each of those locations that is brought together at the time of query. So that's another different, interesting model. But we have that robustly if you have the right kind of study and you have the resources to support the work that goes to query all of these institutions as opposed to just one. But the data is all standardized to the extent, as I mentioned, standardization has a, this variant meaning. The ENACT network is the next phase of the ACT network. This um, uh, we support as, as well. And then I'm going to move into the other part of the talk that I'm going to get very excited about in these common fund programs. So, so the common fund programs is something that's supported from the Office of Strategic Coordination, really the director's office of the National Institutes of Health. And at the current time, this is the list of these common fund programs. They all have this characteristic that they're funded approximately 10 years, usually five years. And if it's going well, renewed for five years. Um, you'll notice the cellular senescence network in here that I mentioned. You'll notice um, HubMap in here somewhere. Here's HubMap. Um, and so we're the core, one of the core collaborators for the data coordinating for these common fund programs. And um, even the coordinating center is multiple institutions because they're just so darn huge. Then there is a coordinating center of coordinating centers. Can you imagine? So there's something called the common fund data ecosystem. And there's a team that coordinates the data amongst those. It's not actual data coordination, it's metadata coordination. So just the data about all of this data. And if you look HubMap, this is based on a file count and a common fund program. And even though it's a relatively newer one, um, it's got more files than anybody. And we only send a fraction of the information because we otherwise we're overwhelmed. Uh, the system. So there are just millions, tens of millions of files in um, in HubMap that brings together all this molecular data that's organized in all of these ways I'm going to show you in just a moment. But if you take the same view and you switch this little thing from file count to number of patients, HubMap ends up at the other end. Because it's a smaller number of patients, it's really about 120 now. And like I said, it's a fraction of the data, but um, it's at the other end because it's patients that we have a tremendous amount of molecular detail on some little tiny piece of them. And so understanding where you fit in this kind of marketplace, if you will, is really important to know what data to go looking for. So the hub map has these 60 some sites. You can go read about it. This is actually an older paper. There's a newer paper that just came out 
um, saying what the next phase of, of HubMap looks like. But there's you know institutions all around the country and some around the world uh, that are participating in this. And the challenge is to coordinate all these labs with really clear standards that the data is collected in a similar way from all of these places. Here's a look at a visualization of the data that has flowed into HubMap so far um, from these major laboratories as the initiators of it and then expanding to a number of other laboratories, the many different types of Im um, single cell imaging and omics data coming through, which organs they're related to. And so this is a Sankey flow diagram where a particular line flows through these various things and gets over here to publish 1,500 42 data sets as of this morning. And um, there's data sets that are in QA and there's new data sets. Um, this is a data flow diagram, just to again, show you the complexity of what's going on here under the hood. So registering data is one thing, but then it's validated. It has to be ingested in certain formats. And then I'm going to show you another box now that is really just just, the, just this side inside of this annotate box alone. <laughs> from a process flow perspective. So the data is there, you have to validate it, run a process pipeline, see if that fails, et cetera. That looks like this. Just inside that little tiny box, we have all of this flow um, going on, whether it succeeded the auto-processing, whether the pipeline ran effectively, because in order to achieve that fairness, we run or run pipelines on the data the same way in whichever lab it came from. Okay, then we have this. So this is, um, I could do an hour on this alone, but I'm going to try and keep it down to a minute or so. What this is, is the, one of our really core um, advances. And what we did is we said, okay, we have to support all of these different things. There's different tools, there's different data sources, there's an application programming interface layer, which means you can write code that gets data against that. And we built an architecture that's built on Globus. So the, the Globus here is in pink. It allows authentication authorization I talked about, it allows file transfer. And we can take the tokens that it sends of who people are, we pass that through another gateway that um, that you know tells us what thing that it's going to call. This passes down to the API layer and then goes against databases, against different um, applications. So the test is a single cell uh, visualization tool. The portal is the web portal itself. At uh, the data portal, I think data.hubmapconsortium.org. There's a registration interfaces that are built by the team in Indiana. There's a team in uh, New York that builds um, the azimuth tool that many of you may be familiar with working in single cell that calls cell type um, annotations. Those things are all working through a set of unique identifiers, um, entity or provenance management, um, core things like antibody references, cell references, ontologies that I'll talk about. So these all work interoperating with each other, with the pink being a subscribe service, the blue being the ones that are actually on-premise at the supercomputing center, and the orange ones are actually running in AWS. So it's a combined hybrid cloud microservice architecture. And we've been able to do this now in, in multiple different ways and multiple different projects. And it seems to be a secret sauce now that is moving forward for us, that we can have all of these databases and things that we talked about. We can build up APIs against them that then have the applications read against the APIs, which allows security, uh, separability. Many of these features that I talked about as the core needs are enabled by this kind of architecture. All right, um, SendNet is the last uh, one uh, to mention here in terms of the vision behind it, this is another common fund program we're serving as the coordinating center for this program. And it's really functionally to build a map around senescent cells. So really do what HubMap is doing with the single cell biology, but map those senescent cells and all the different tissues. And this is the sort of canonical, what they call a marker paper for the consortium, all the different organs, different types of um, technologies, and those are growing uh, rapidly into, into other things. And again, we collect all of these things and put them together. What's interesting here, and here we have the, the tissue coverage from, from the different labs, if you want to take a look at that. What's interesting is there's also working groups in these consortium. And sometimes the most interesting things don't come from the data, they come from the working groups coming together. And so this is where we get into the stuff that I'm really passionate about, if you haven't noticed already, um, in the biomarkers domain. So what happened is, the group of senescence researchers decided, by goodness, we need to review the literature and find out what's going on. They found 600 different biomarkers for senescence, 
discovered, where they're mentioned in literature, put that all together, whether it's cell cycle, classified it in terms of the type of thing that's happening, cell cycle arrest, SAS, burn inflammatory things, um, DNA damage response, um, whatever is being discussed in those many papers. And that resulted in this spreadsheet that was combinedly, you know, jointly edited and re-edited and, and managed. And then we had to stop and, you know, make it all meet specifications so that genes are all properly identified. And, and um, you know, the, the, we only allow the senescence um, hallmarks that we allow, these kinds of things, and then all of the PubMed citations. And so this is about 700 rows of data. It's available free online um, where the last thing was was uh, marked, I guess here, Doc Senate Consortium or Biomarkers. That's the supplemental data link. Well, this link, what we can do if we're really thoughtful about these types of APIs and things, we can write APIs that work against a, a Google spreadsheet and build the same thing. So this is actually a tool. It's worth going there and looking at uh, Docs in essence slash biomarkers. And um, it builds in real time in your browser and builds the network by organ and by the specific um, uh, gene or senescent hallmark are color coded, the pinker in human, the greener in mice, because this consortium does both. And if you click on these, it takes you directly to, to PubMed. Uh, if you hover over them, it shows you exactly which gene it is or which um, activity it is, um, which marker it is. And then it links you into PubMed for that, for that marker. So now I'm gonna rifle through uh, the very last piece, I'm a little behind time, but I think we'll be okay. Um, and this is the unified biomedical knowledge graph. So this now goes up to get in neck deep in that um, in that diagram. And this is the stuff that I really do the work ourselves, working very closely with one of our staff, Alan Simmons. And we designed this data structure that is being shown here that basically says we have these concepts of things in the universe and we have a code for them. This might be a CPT code, an ICD code. In this case, it's a chemical marker, a Chevy code, and it has a name for it in this case, and it has some definition. It has a semantic type of whatever it is. We ingest from dozens of places, and I'm not gonna show you the ingest process, all of these different things, and we overlay them. And the power of it is it figures out only based on what the actual source says it references. If this is this chemical and the other source said it's that chemical, then they become the same concept node. And so we bring together source after source after source after source and what are called assertions. What the assertions do, and I'm not gonna walk all through this, but what the assertions do is they allow us to pile them on top of each other and essentially create an unlimited number of transitive properties. This is all this generation framework, or all this stuff comes in, it's here for you to look at later. We can get this out. But what happens is all of these different sources of information start to intersect with each other. Some of them are already intersecting because we start with the unified medical language system from NLM, and then we add all these things to it. This is a, a, a poor man sort of heat map done, you know, sort of done by hand, looking at all the overlaps. So if you look at something like Rx Norm, or you look at SNOMED, which is used clinically, it has a lot of um, overlap with these other technologies, whether disease ontology or the HGNC gene markers, it has had very, very little, but you look at something like uh, NCI and it um, it does intersect with, with many, many of these genes, whereas something like OMIM interacts with many more. And so combinations of these different um, things together allow you to have all of the entities and all of the relationships between the entities that you might want, whether it's you know something like Uberon that is not in the uh, UMLS or OB that is uh, about assays. Um, it, it doesn't intersect with any of this stuff here, but it intersects with other things that then intersect with those. And we assemble these, we have this thing called the Unified Biomedical Knowledge Graph that assembles all of these assertions together. We've started us uh, bringing them. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention on that is that this is a GitHub repository and in all of its color, this is the work of one person. And so we have dozens of programmers that are in repositories working together like this. And that's this, the, another secret sauce across multiple institutions, across working together in Zoom, they're working on the same software together. This is a query against that database that is looking to build a tree of cell type annotations from azimuth and the ASC TMB, if you know what that is, um, it's a whole structure of folks doing work in conference rooms to come up with what biomarkers are in particular cells and cell types. 
And so this combines those two into a single tree that you can navigate to um, cross between the cell type annotation and the, the cell types in ASCTB. And then the last thing is um, this uh, has now gone to the extent that the Common Fund program is bringing the data, the knowledge level rather than that data metadata where I mentioned files and different things coming in. The Common Fund is now bringing in knowledge assertions from those various different programs into this database where you can begin to then associate things in uh, like uh, the Glygen you know, service associated with GTEx um, and cross them through the gene relationships and the possibilities are endless of what you can query. So back to the beginning, um, this explains how we ended up in here based on all of the kind of work that we've done. I want to reemphasize we have these goals around usability, collecting, managing data, making it usable, that it follows very specific approaches that are highly technical, but has to have the people involved. And then the, my last comment is we have just tremendous opportunities for this kind of thing in the Pittsburgh region. I'm not gonna go through these details. Many of you know them. If you're working with IPM, working with um, Adrian and some of these uh, programs. And we've actually built a breast cancer data mart out of Neptune that then brings in the imaging and the Epic and Cerner data, cancer registry data, that um, um, Dr. Rita Zuli really has been uh, driving. I mentioned working with the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. This is the project that launched a thousand collaborations with, uh, with Adrian and, and our teams and um, teams at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, a paper out um, late last year, um, showing what happens when you bring together all of these things from, from these different places. And this is sort of bringing back to that um, initial idea around the learning health system and what we can become by putting all of these different pieces in parts, whether administrative or technical or data uh, permissions together into a way that we can really build something uh, really powerful and unique. The acknowledgements are here. They don't fit in a slide. They're linked out to other acknowledgement pages because this is the way that this big science has become. And then I'll take you back to this and I'll leave it there. We have some time for questions. Thank you. Jonathan, that was fantastic. I will clap on behalf of everyone who was uh, <laughs> the 40 people who are online. And if anyone wants to ask a question, they're welcome to put it in the chat. There's nothing in the chat. So Jonathan, I'll ask the first one. Um, have you, you have this amazing, like, you know, data storage at Neptune. Have you run analysis on the whole thing, like done a knowledge graph on the whole corpus of information or, you know, a, an NLU or something to look at the whole thing? You know, it's a it's a great question, and the the challenge is we're not even sure what that means, and so it's a question that comes up. But you know, there's billions of rows of all these different multi-dimensional data. It's it's probably million dimensional data with billion of rows, and so with a million dimensions and a billion rows, not sure what that analysis would be. But I think um, what we've started to do is to think very carefully about this this wisdom, you know, this knowledge layer. How do we take many many patients that are the same? and come up with the assertion, this affects that um, in a way that in that sense, we could distill it all into something that would make sense and tell us what this data tells us. So I think it has to head in that direction because of the sheer um, multi-dimensionality of it. And there is a question. This is too much for one presentation. <laughs> That's the, uh, I think, sinking in the, uh, sinking it. how will we be able to get a link to review the talk in future depth? Yes, it was very intentionally too much for one presentation because I wanted to introduce to you the tremendous scope that is there so that we can have all of those many follow-ups. I think um, part of the point of kicking off uh, IPM, I think with someone local is to is to stimulate all those kinds of conversations over the next year. So yes, I will provide this to, to uh, Adrian who can move things yeah. forward. Most of these things are captures from websites. It's all public. Yeah, and then people can reach out to you. And then Bob Nishikawa said, are there other institutions building something similar? I, what are our peers or the ones you kind of respect? Yeah, we we um, I, I think it would be fair to say that we're amongst the leaders in this. There are probably a handful of them around uh, the country. There's different states and different countries that have assembled electronic health records together in larger and more complete ways. 
although we're already rather large in that regard and we have a lot of services available. In terms of the integration of the ability to use the same types of infrastructures for both the clinical and the biological, I'm not sure that exists anywhere. I think that's the space where I showed that architecture that we're building them into a similar architecture is, is probably um, true, you know, truly leading. I think are people building something similar? Absolutely. There's other consortium I didn't mention, um, N3C, other things. There are individual institutions that are working with commercial enterprises to try to create data um, collections um, together. And um, it's, a, it's a vast landscape at this time. But I, I would say through the CTSI programs, the on the clinical side, um, there are similarities. Through the common fund programs, there are similarities. And we work with our peers in those kinds of uh, places. And so the similarities are everywhere. But when you get into the details, I think we provide a pretty deep um, services relative to others. And from the Q&A, all and the- I, And I left out a whole piece about how we provide computing, by the way. So I, I did I did delete a huge section about um, computing and secured computing where it's sensitive data, which, you know, is too much, too much. <laughs> you mean supporting computing on high-performance computing? That's what you mean? Spinning up high-performance computing or in the cloud in a HIPAA-constrained environment where you can bring in people that maybe not have permissions to take the data with them. And there is another question, are or is the UBKGB, U, not KGB, the UBKG, that was, a, that was a slip of the tongue, and the uh, petagraph accessible via user-friendly interfaces for interrogating the data sets without the need of installing pipelines by individual users? I, how, how do you get to it and how do you use it? Yes, so we are right in its transition of phase. The initial project only is a year old and it's working with the investigators across the data coordinating centers in, in CFDE. They download it now as a Neo4j database. They can run it on their desktop. That is switching over to uh, API-based uh, set of uh, activities right now. So right now at this moment, it's available within the APIs that are supported in HubMap, but that's not all of that intersecting uh, data coordinating center data. The data coordinating center themselves have only contributed the data to it earlier this year. And so they're still doing the major query use cases that were, that were intended, but it's actually downloadable, runs in Docker, can run on most any desktop. And then the database itself, you want to download and point to the Docker containers the way we're running it now. We're gonna move it over to a, um, a more online, you know, web interactive type of load balanced infrastructure in the next year of funding. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. That's great. So there are no other questions, Jonathan. So we will uh, actually. There's one more. You mentioned the HPT, the HPC computation services. Are those limited to specific data repositories, and are they hosted on AWS? Yeah. So. Um, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center is our major partner in that. And then the CRC is another major partner in that. It depends on exactly what you're doing. But in general, they're free resources in terms of cost. But the, the um, you have to meet the regulatory environments and you have to make a good case <laughs> for being the person that gets to use all of that stuff, right? Um, AWS, you can put in your credit card and you know run up a bill as large as you want. Um, and we have some ways to um, to support individuals. We even support some of our collaborators within the data coordinating centers on their AWS infrastructure. Um, so all of those things are, are possible in different ways. The data really drives what you're permitted to do though. And so knowing your data and where its limitations are, therefore where you can take it to or where you can bring computing to it, depending on your point of view, um, it, it varies really based on the data, I would say. Fantastic, Jonathan. Yes, so this, that's, and, and you just got to thank you in the comments. So that was great. And I guess, um, as was said on the first comment, if anyone wants to contact Jonathan or his office, yeah, please. please. Edu, that would be great. And um, Jonathan, thanks very much for, for opening the series. Happy to do it. And I wish I could see all of you, but, um, you know, please be in contact. Um, that's what this is all about. Cool. Fantastic. Thank thanks, Jonathan. Bye.